Hi. So Thanksgiving is over, so I thought it good if we put our minds toward Christmas. And I have two Christmas stories today written by Katherine Patterson. You might be familiar with her. She's won several Newbery Awards and uh, National Book Awards and has written novels for children and young adults and for uh, adults. The first one is The Handmaid of the Lord. Now, people think that when your father is a minister that you get special favors, like you're God's pet or something. Rachel, for one, knew absolutely positively that this was not true. God didn't love her better than Jason McMillan, who was getting an entire set of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for Christmas. God didn't love her better than Carrie Wilson, who was getting a new Barbie house, dollhouse with two new dolls, outfits included. Not that Rachel really wanted a Power Ranger or dollhouse, either for that matter, but it was the principle of the thing. Carrie and Jason were getting what they asked Santa Claus for. When Rachel asked Santa for a horse, John and Beth just rolled their eyes. John and Beth were her older brother and sister. Beth was 11 and John was 13, and they thought they knew everything. But where would we keep a horse, Rachel, her mother had asked. She was changing baby David's diapers and not paying Rachel much attention. We live in the church manse. You know how small our yard is. Rachel, her father said in his most patient voice, what is Christmas really about? If all you think about is Santa Claus, you're going to miss the main event. Rachel's heart sank. When your father told you to think what Christmas was really all about, she knew what that meant. It meant no horse, not even a pony. Minister's kids never got really good presents at Christmas. She should know that by now. It didn't count if you were naughty or nice. Gregory Austin had pulled the alarm last Sunday and made the fire truck come in the middle of the church service, but he was getting his own personal computer. His daddy had said so. Her daddy told everyone they were supposed to be God's servants, like Jesus was. He didn't mention presents. So, no good presents. Rachel had given up on that. But a big role in the primary class's ch Christmas play, that shouldn't be too much to ask for. She was by far the best actress in the second grade. Plus, she went to Sunday school every single week, even when she had the sniffles or when it snowed so hard that she and John and Beth were the only kids there. Don't you think a kid who comes every Sunday, no matter if it's a blizzard, should get a good part in the, Christ in the primary classes play, she asked. We live next door to the church, stupid, John has said. You don't get brownie points for walking across your own yard. You're the minister's daughter, Rachel, Beth had said. It would look bad if you grabbed a big part. Well, you got to be the angel Gabriel in both the second and the third grade, Rachel reminded her. Well, that was different, Beth said. I was the only one in either class who could remember all the lines. The head angel has a lot to say. Besides, I speak out. Everyone in the back row heard me perfectly. I can speak out, Rachel said, but no one paid her any attention. When she was five, she'd been part of the heavenly host. It was a terrible part. The angel costumes are made of a stiff, gauzy stuff that itched something awful. And afterwards, Miss McLaughlin, who ran the pageant, yelled at her right in front of everybody, Rachel Thompson, angels are spiritual beatings. How, they do not scratch themselves while they sing. You had the congregation laughing at the heavenly host. I was mortified. Last year, Ms. McLaughlin had taken a rest from directing, and Ms. Westford had won the run the pageant. Ms. Westford believed in equal opportunity. So for the first time in the history of the First Presbyterian Church, girls had been shepherds and wise men. That was okay with the girls, but the boys were mad. They didn't like the itchy annual costumes at all, and a lot of the fathers complained. But Rachel had been a much better shepherd than those stupid boys. She didn't care what anyone had said afterwards. She knew what the Bible meant when it said the shepherds were sore afraid. When Mr. Nelson shined the spotlight at them to show that the angel of the Lord was about to come upon them, Rachel had shown everyone in the church what it meant to be sore afraid. Help, help, she cried, loud enough to be heard by the people in the very back row. Don't let it get me. The congregation laughed. So did Gabriel and all the shepherds and the entire heavenly host. Mary laughed so hard she started choking, and Joseph had to whack her on the back. 
Her father had said later it had been a, a brand new insight into the Christmas story. And her mother said, never mind, dear, they weren't laughing at you. But she knew better. No one in the whole church understood what the story was really about. When the Bible said, sore afraid, you were supposed to be scared. When that big light hit her face, Rachel had been trembly all over. She knew in her heart that she was the only kid in the pageant who felt that way. Not even the second and third graders who got all the big parts did them right. If you couldn't have a scratching angel, you sure shouldn't have Joseph yawning so wide you could drive a tractor trailer straight down his tonsils. It had been a hard year. Her mother had been tired and pregnant for most of it. And then when David finally was born, she'd gotten tired and busy. Beth thought David was the cutest thing in the world. Was I cute when I was little? Rachel asked her. I can't remember, Beth said. I knew you cried a lot and your face got really red. And she went back to goo-gooing at, at the baby. John wasn't as silly, as silly, but he was always bragging about how great it was to have a little brother finally. What's the matter with little sisters, Rachel asked. John just rolled his eyes. Now at the end of the worst year of her entire life, Christmas wasn't going to be any better. Even the carols were against her. All those songs about the city of David. Could we make up a Christmas song about the city of Rachel, she asked her mother. But her mother just smiled and kept on singing about David. Hey, John said one night, I just realized we're all in the Christmas story. David, Elizabeth, John. Well, what about me, Rachel said. Oh, you're in it, John said. I am? Yeah, I remember some verse, I don't know where, somewhere off to the side of the story about someone named Rachel weeping and wailing. It's because King Herod killed all her children, Beth said. It wasn't fair. Everyone else had a nice place in the story. Everyone but Rachel. It made her more determined than ever to have a good part in the play, one in which she would not scratch or yell or wail. Mary. She would be Mary. She was old enough this year. She was the best actress in the second grade. Surely even if she was the minister's daughter, Ms. McLaughlin would pick her. She'd be so good in class that Ms. McLaughlin would just see that nobody deserved to be Mary more than Rachel did. Besides, her little brother had already been chosen to be baby Jesus. She ought to be Mary. Jesus didn't have a stranger be his mother. It might scare him. Now, said Miss McLaughlin at the first practice, it's a good thing we have a lot of kindergarten to third graders in this church because we have a lot of parts in the play. Miss McLaughlin, Rachel said, what is it, Rachel? Uh, Rachel talked fast because she knew Miss McLaughlin sounded impatient. I know I'm the minister's kid and that I was little sometimes. Yes, Rachel, but I studied the part really hard. And since my brother is the baby Jesus, I thought, well, it would be probably mean a lot to him if, well, if his big sister could be Mary. But we don't have sixth graders in the play, Rachel. Elizabeth's too old. I don't mean Elizabeth, Miss McLaughlin. I meant, well, what's the matter with me? And there was a burst of laughter in the room. Everyone was laughing at her. Rachel's face went scarlet. Shut up. I'm serious. I know the story better than anybody, and it is my brother. Everyone laughed harder, and even the little ones who were going to be itchy angels were giggling. Rachel, dear, said Miss McLaughlin after she finally got control of the group, of course you know the Christmas story. After all, your father is the minister, but Mary is a very difficult role. I could do it, Rachel muttered. But she knew it was no use. People weren't supposed to laugh at Mary, and everyone laughed at her even when they paid her, when they paid her any attention at all. Carrie, Miss McLaughlin was saying, how would you like to be our Mary this year? Carrie Wilson, she had blue eyes and blonde curls all the way down her back, didn't look at all like Mary. And that fake smile, it made Rachel sick. Carrie Wilson's Mary would look like a plastic wimp, and Mary was the handmaid of the Lord, for heaven's sake not some department store dummy. Rachel could hardly listen at Miss, Miss McLaughlin went down the list telling everyone what they were supposed to be. She knew now she wouldn't even get a speaking part. Miss McLaughlin didn't like her. Nobody liked her, not even God. And finally, Miss McLaughlin stopped and Rachel looked up. She hadn't heard her name. She didn't want to say anything because maybe her name had been called when she wasn't listening. And then Ms. McLaughlin would say something else to fuss, uh, Fussy, but she couldn't stand it, and she raised her hand. Yes, Rachel, about my part. Yes, Rachel, this year you have a very important part. I do? 
Yes, you will be our understudy. Our what? Since you know the story as well, so well, you will be prepared to substitute in case any of our actors become ill or unable to perform. Substitute? You mean I don't have a part of my own? Well, you have all the parts in case. Well, I suppose, for example, Greg Gabriel should lose, lose her voice. You would step in and be Gabriel. Jennifer Rouse, the third grader who had been chosen to be Gabriel, gave Rachel a dirty look. She had no intention of losing her voice. Or if, and here Ms. McLaughlin smiled sadly at Sir Carrie Wilson, our Mary would have suddenly have to visit her grandmother in Ohio, you would have to step in and be Mary. My grandmother's coming here for Christmas, Ms. McLaughlin, Carrie said sweetly. Rachel wasn't stupid. She knew what Ms. McLaughlin was doing. She wasn't keeping Rachel from having a big part. She was making sure Rachel wouldn't have any part. She told her mother that she was never going back to Sunday school again in her entire life. Nonsense, dear, her mother said. And, of course, she went back. Ministers' children have to go to Sunday school. It's a law or something. And then a miracle happened. One week before Christmas, Carrie Wilson, who wore the world, world's prissiest little blue leather boots, slipped on the ice at the mall parking lot and broke both of her arms, both her arms. Rachel was overcome with exceeding great joy. God did love her. He did one arm might count as an accident, but two arms were a miracle. God meant business. No matter how determined Ms. McLaughlin was to keep her out of the play, God was going to make sure not only that she got in, but that she would have the most important part in the whole shebang. She was going to be Mary, the handmaid of the Lord. Of course, she didn't tell anyone how joyful she was. She was too smart for that. When Ms. McLaughlin called her on the phone, Rachel practically cried at the news she would have to pinch hit for our poor little Carrie. I'll do my best, Ms. McLaughlin, she said quietly and humbly, just like the real Mary would have. She went early to the dress rehearsal so Ms. McLaughlin could try the costume on her. It fit perfectly. Well, it would have to fit practically anybody. Those robe things weren't exactly any size, but Rachel took it as a good sign when Ms. McLaughlin sighed and admitted, yes, it did fit. Don't you worry, Miss McLaughlin, Rachel said. I'm the understudy. I know the part perfectly, which was a little silly since Mary didn't say a word and just looked lovingly into the manger while everyone else sang and carried on. But she wanted Miss McLaughlin to know she wasn't going to do anything to make anybody laugh this year. She would be such a good Mary that Miss McLaughlin would be practically down on her knees begging her to take the bar part again and again. We have to eat early, she told her mother on Christmas Eve. Miss McLaughlin wants to cast there an hour before the service. Thank goodness, says John. I don't think I could stand another hour of all these loud glorias you're singing. Rachel didn't care. She was so happy. The glorias just burst from her. Besides, she had to get them all out before seven. She couldn't let a stray gloria pass her lips when she was behind the manger. God might understand, but Miss McLaughlin sure wouldn't. She was all dressed in the sky-blue robe, sitting quietly, looking down into the empty manger, and Miss McLaughlin, hoarse from yelling at the heavenly host, was giving last-minute directions to the wise men, when suddenly the back door of the sanctuary opened. Why, Miss Wilson, Carrie, Miss McLaughlin said. Rachel jerked up in alarm. It was Carrie, standing in the darkened sanctuary, her fake fur-trimmed coat hanging off her shoulders and both her arms bound to the front of her body. She insisted, Ms. Wilson was saying. She said, the show must go on. I talked to Dr. Franklin, and he said it would be the best thing in the world for her. She was so distressed about letting everyone down that she was it was having a negative effect on the healing process. Two mothers yanked the beautiful blue robe off of Rachel and draped it over Carrie's head. See, it was meant to be, Ms. Wilson said. It totally hides the cast. Rachel slunk off the platform and slumped down in the first pew. No one noticed. All the angels were ooing and aahing about how brave Carrie was to come and save the play. Oh, yes, yeah, she's in terrible pain, her mother was saying, but she couldn't bear to disappoint your, you all. No one cared that Rachel was disappointed, not even God. Of course, God had known all along that Carrie would show up at the last minute and steal the part back. God knew everything, and he had let Rachel sing and rejoice and think for a few days that he was on her side, that he had chosen her, like Mary, to be his handmaid. But it was just a big joke, a big mean joke. She kicked the red carpet at her, her feet. Off stage, everyone. Time to line up. 
Where do you go when there wasn't any place for you? She looked around. People were beginning to arrive for the service. She slipped farther down in the pew. She didn't want her family to see her. They'd find out soon enough that God had fired her. She saw her mother carry David up the far aisle. The baby was sucking happily on his pacifier. He would be a good Jesus. Everyone would say so. Miss McLaughlin was waiting at the door of the hall. She took David and said something to Mom, who cocked her head in a doubtful manner. Was she telling Mom that Rachel wasn't going to be merry after all? If she did, maybe Mom would come over and take her on her lap and tell her she was sorry. But no, Mom didn't even see her. The play went well. None of the angels cried or scratched. Gabriel knew all her lines and said them loud enough to be heard almost to the back row. The wise men remembered to carry their gifts and nobody's crown rolled off. Joseph didn't yawn and Mary gazed sweetly into the manger. It was all perfect. Perfect without her. Rachel felt like weeping and wailing like the Rachel in the Bible. But then suddenly, a miracle occurred. Baby Jesus began to cry. Not just cry, but scream, yell his little lungs out. Kara Wilson forgot about being married. She turned absolutely white, and her eyes went huge. She was about to panic. She would have probably gotten up and run, but with her arms bound under her robe, she couldn't move. She looked at Joseph. Do something, she whispered. Joseph's face went bright red, but he didn't move a muscle. It was up to Rachel. She jumped from her pew, dashed up the chancel steps. She was still panting when she got to the manger. Rachel poked around under the baby till she found the pacifier and jammed it into David's open mouth. He clamped down on it at once. The big church went silent except for his noisy sucking. Rachel smiled down at him. He was a lovely Jesus. Who do you think you are? Carrie Wilson hissed through her teeth, but the whisper was almost loud enough to be heard in the back row. Rachel could hear a snicker from somewhere out in the darkened sanctuary. Behold, Rachel straightened up and stared sternly in the direction of the offender. There was no doubt that the people in the last pew could hear her. I am the handmaid of the Lord, and I say to you, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill to men, women, and children. And nobody laughed. They didn't dare. So, <laughs> so the other one is, a, this is one I always cry, so I warn you. I warn you ahead of time. But this is an, another aspect of Christmas. The story is called A Stubborn Sweetness. The call came early Christmas morning. I was still asleep, and my voice must have sounded peevish when I answered the phone. You needn't be annoyed with me, Judson, my sister said. I can't help it. Well, what is it, Fran? Well, what do you think it is? Why else would I call you at this hour? Is it Father? Of course it's Father. The doctor says he won't last another day. He thinks you should come immediately. Part of me wanted to protest. I didn't want to leave my family on Christmas, at Christmas time. What did it matter if I came or not? My father had not recognized me for ages. I dutifully went to see him three or four times a year. He would sit in his chair in the sterile nursing home, nodding to me. Sometimes when he was most alert, he would call me Wesley. Wesley was my brother who died in Vietnam. But usually he would mumble things I could not understand and nod uncomprehendingly as I would vainly try to carry on a conversation. Once he looked at me straight in the face, his eyes were clearing, so I thought for a moment he knew me, and perhaps he did, but what he said was, tell your mother that Wesley is home. This time I nodded stupidly, not even trying to remind him that both Mother and Wesley had been dead for many years. Part of me did not want to go and say goodbye to an old man who could not hear me, who had hardly listened to me even when we were both younger, and yet I had to go. My wife understood even though the children did not. You need to go, Justin, Marilyn said, not for Fran's sake, just but for your own. I drove myself to the airport, bought a standby ticket, watched three flights take off without me, each time I called Fran to ask how he was. You've got to hurry, she said, but it was late afternoon before I got a plane headed for Springfield. When we landed, I called Marilyn, and when I tried to reach Fran, the line was busy, so rather than waste time, I rented a car and started the 50-mile drive. The road on which I was traveling was new, but the countryside was the farmland in which I had grown up. The sky on this Christmas Eve was clear and star-filled, spreading peace over the rolling hills and shadow of the mountain beyond. The world of regrets and sorrow and imminent death seemed far away. 
I thought about my father, not the invalid he had become, but as I had known him when I was a boy. He was a strong, gruff man, a farmer who owed no man anything. If Wesley had lived, I think I might have grown up without my father ever really noticing me. Perhaps I'm unjust. I'm sure my mother would say so. She was forever trying to interpret us to each other. For her sake, as we both grew older, we tried to understand, but it was on that ser terrible Christmas after Wesley's death. Just then, my headlights caught a figure stepping out into the road. I swerved and missed, but I was shaken. As I straightened the car, my heart still pounding, I caught a glimpse in the rearview mirror of the person I'd nearly struck. He was in the road, waving his arms at me. So without thinking, I stopped the car, began to back slowly down the shoulder. When I got alongside, I stuck my head out and said, Get out of the road! I nearly hit you! But it wasn't a man. It was a young girl, her hair streaming across a rucksack sack on her back. She wore no hat or gloves. Yeah, her scant chin went up. Well, watch where you're going. Then suddenly, almost coy, hey, give me a ride to town. Without waiting for me to answer, she reached behind me, unlatched the back door, and was in the car before I could protest. As I shifted into drive and moved out onto the road, she swung the pack off her back and put it on the seat beside her. I'd seen enough of her face now to realize that she was about the age of my daughter, Jenny, who was barely 14. Where are you headed, I asked, trying to sound casual. Well, who needs to know? Well, no one. I couldn't help wondering you remind me of my daughter. Well, I ain't. Lucky you. We drove on in silence. She was wrestling something from her rucksack. I switched on the radio. The car was filled with joyful sound of a carol. My mind went from the waif behind me to my mother. She loved Christmas so much, especially the music. It was then that I felt the hard, round pressure against my shoulder. Shut that thing off, she ordered. I turned off the radio, too amazed to be truly frightened. Where on earth had this child gotten a gun? Now pass me back your wallet and your watch and anything valuable. Well, I'll have to stop the car first. Okay, but no fooling around. Here. So I eased the car onto the shoulder, shut off the engine. She held the gun, pointing roughly at my right ear while I got out of the car, took off my watch, wedding ring, unloaded the pockets of my overcoat and trousers, put the contents on the passenger seat, her hand was shaking as the gun followed my every move. I wasn't afraid she would shoot deliberately, but in her anxiety she might accidentally. And then I straightened up to close the door, and I looked more closely at the trembling weapon, and the car's dim overhead light gave away its secret. The gun was a toy. My impulse was to grab it laughing, but the look on her face stopped me. Instead, I shut the door and began walking toward, down the road. She yelled after me, "'Where the hell do you think you're going?' I thought you wanted the car as well. Oh, come back here, she said, her voice breaking. I can't drive. I came back and got in. The gun was at my shoulder at once. Now go, she said. Don't try to make a fool out of me again. She wasn't crying, but she was close to it. Don't use the credit cards. Shut up and drive. Seriously, they'll get you right away. There's about 200 in cash, and day after tomorrow, you should be able to pawn the watch for at least 100. It's antique gold. What's with you? I'm trying to help. I ran away from home once. It's no fun. I don't need help. Well, you do need money. You can't get far without it. Don't I know, she mumbled. And a minute later, she poked me in the hard with the plastic gun barrel. Are you on the level about the credit cards, she asked. I swear they're not worth it. I'd, like, I'd have to report them sw stolen. Well, what about the watch and stuff? Well, if you let me have my wedding ring and the credit cards, you can take the money and the watch, and I'll consider them a Christmas present meaning I won't even call the police. Well, Mr. Santa Claus himself, her voice was sarcastic, but the pressure on my shoulder lessened for a moment, and then she jabbed me hard. You're putting me on. I could kill you, you know. But it wouldn't be smart, I said, and you don't strike me as a dumb person. She snorted. That isn't what my dad said, and he should know. Fathers aren't always right. My father, oh, forget your father. I can't forget my father. He's dying. That's where I'm going to see him once more before he dies. Dying? It's all right. He's very old and sick. He's ready to die. Well, you ask him, he might get, you might get another opinion. You think so? I don't want to talk about it. Well, you're young, but I might die, she blurted out. Oh, God, I might die. The gun fell from my shoulder to the floor, and she put both her hands to her face and began to cry. You dropped your gun, I said quietly. She stopped crying instantly and snatched up the gun, poked me three or four times, and dropped it again. You knew it was fake all the time, didn't you? I nodded. 
My dad was right. I'm the dumbest bitch in the world. You're not so dumb. Yeah, then how come I'm pregnant? She started yelling. Is that why you ran away? It's either that or get thrown out. He don't care if I live or die, as long as I don't bother him. My first thought was to rush in with words of reassurance. Of course, our father cared. Even now, he must be calling the state police, asking for help. But I kept quiet. I knew I was thinking of my father, what he would have done. I didn't know this child's father, and suddenly I wanted to give her my father for all his sternness and anger and doubts because I knew what my father would have done. May I tell you a story? For an answer, she blew her nose loudly. It was in 1967 I began realizing that Christmas of 1967 was as remote to her as the first Christmas. In early November, we had word through the Red Cross that my brother Wesley had, was dead. His plane had crashed over North Vietnam two years before. He died in prison. For a moment, the cold pain of Wesley's death returned. I had adored him. So, she prompted, impatient to be done. It wasn't only that he was dead, but it was the way that he died that hurt my father so. I think if he had been killed in the crash, my father would have been able to bear it. But it was the waste, the agony of his dying bit by bit in prison. You do talk a lot about dying, she said. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out why my father was so terribly bitter. He was always, he'd always been a religious man. He'd even named his son after church heroes. But going back, he had, he had always despised me. I told myself it was only for Wesley's sake that he had put up with me. Now Wesley was gone, so I was going to. Oops, I skipped a page, sorry. Once he heard the news about Wesley, he stopped going to church. He stopped saying grace at meals. He even tried to keep my mother from taking me and my sister to Sunday school. I was only nine. I couldn't understand. Easy, she said. Sometimes you've got to pay God back. Well, Christmas came, and I was supposed to sing a solo in the Sunday school program. I was all excited about it, and so was my mother. I could tell even my sister, who usually ignored me, was proud that I'd been chosen. The night of the program, my mother tried to persuade my father to go. I was a bit afraid of my father. I was worried that if he went, he might be disappointed in me. So I wasn't sure I wanted him to go, but I wanted my mother to be happy, and that was the real reason I wanted him to go. You should have left him alone. Yes, we should have, I guess. Anyhow, at supper time, my, mo my mother said he owed it to me to go. That was a big night in my life. He would be proud to hear how well I sang. He can sing it right here in the kitchen for me, my father said. Well, you should have done it. Well, I did. I stood there in the kitchen after supper while he drank his coffee, and I sang for him. Do you know the song, No, There's a Song in the Air? I don't know classical, and I don't like it either. Well, don't worry, I won't sing it for you, I said. But I sang it for him, and the more I sang, the more frightened I became. I could tell he was about to burst with rage. Even before I finished, he slammed his fist on the table, sloshed coffee all over the cloth. Lies, he yelled. It's all lies. Then he jumped up and grabbed me by the shoulders. He was like a crazy man. Don't you know what the world is like, Judson? There's no pretty angels flapping their wings. There are no singing in the sky. There's hate and suffering and cruel, cruel death. And then he shoved me aside and grabbed my mother. I don't see it, Agnes. How can you hang on to all this nonsense? The air's not full of music. It's full of bombs crashing and people screaming. My mother's face tightened, but she said very quietly, the song is louder. My father began to curse. I'd never heard him speak a word to my mother in anger. And now all because of me, because I wanted to sing in that stupid Sunday school program, he was cursing her. I ran out of the house. It was a cold night, but it was a long time before I slowed down enough to notice. I was never going back. He had always despised me. I told myself it's only for Wesley's sake that he had put up with me now. Now Wesley was gone, so I was going too. Before I knew it, I was deep in the woods, almost at the foot of that mountain over there, just as lost as I could be, and it was bitter cold. Well, I take it you didn't freeze to death, she said sarcastically. Well, no, I kept on walking, but it was a perfectly black night with no moon. I couldn't even see a tree before I bumped into it. I was terrified all that trackless night. I was sure I was going to be out there and die on this cold night all alone. Yeah, she said without a trace of sarcasm. And then suddenly I saw a light way off in the distance. I began to stumble toward it. 
It's the most wonderful thing I'd seen in my life, that, that light. I still couldn't see where I was walking, but it didn't matter. I just kept my eye on the light. And you ran smack into the angel of God Almighty. No, it was my father. He had come out to look for me. So he falls down on his knees, begs you to forgive him, and you live happy ever after. No, I just went home with him. It was too late by then for any of us to go to the program, so that was that. We never spoke of it again. Well, you can let me out here, she said. I hadn't realized we were already at the edge of town. I don't like to just drop you off at this time of night. No problem. Look, we're almost at the nursing home. Why don't you wait? As soon as I've seen my father, I'll take you home. She made a sound meaning, meant to be a laugh. Don't you do me any favors, mister. I pulled up in front of the home. When I had parked, I put my wedding ring on and took the money out of my wallet and laid it on the front seat. I don't want your watch, she said. You can take it. Well, thanks, I said. Why don't you wait? I won't be a, bit, a minute. And then she jerked her head in a nod. You're too late, Fran said. He's not responding to anyone now. I went to the bedside, took my father's big hand. It was thinner than I remembered. He looked peaceful. He recognized me this afternoon, Fran said. He spoke to me. Did he? I, I was remembering that light, how he had, come, it, he had come for me that night through the darkness. It didn't make much sense, she, she continued. His voice was stronger than it had been for years. He said, tell your mother the song is louder. I'll be right back, I said, almost running out. The car, the car was empty. As I opened the front door to be sure, the light revealed a $20 bill on the seat. She hadn't wanted to leave me penniless. I never saw her again. I could not tell her my father's last words, not that she would have understood. But then in a way, he was wrong. Both he and my mother were wrong. The song is not louder. It's swallowed up quickly in the cry of anger or the clack of greed. No, the song is not louder, but it persists. It comes, as it had come to me beside my father's bed, a melody of the most stubborn sweetness for which we are never prepared, and we turn away from it again and again and again. But, oh, my child, I said to the empty night, even though the song is not louder, it is stronger, and someday it will find you out there alone in the darkness. And then I turned and went back in to say goodbye to my father. So, I told you I would cry. 